We're coming stronger than a trade offer for Tajay Sharp in a Dynasty League. Episode 3 of Off the Record is ready to roll. Uh, we want to thank you to those who have been tuning in and checking out our little show here on Nickel Press TV. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and actually like the videos. Um, actually, that's only, of course, if you actually do like the videos. Also, make sure to leave your comments. Believe it or not, it really helps a lot towards helping us move up the YouTube search queries. And uh, without your help in doing so, we'll be buried at the bottom. So it really does mean a lot to us. Plus, it's free. So you really don't have to do anything but click a little button. So we'd appreciate it if you did that. Uh, we'll be giving away great prizes and, and uh, items and various swag throughout the season to our subscribers. So you definitely don't want to miss out on that, do you? Um, so that's yet another reason to subscribe to Nickel Press TV. Make sure you're leaving your comments, liking the videos and all that good stuff. Uh, drafts are happening fast and furious right now, but I have to mention some of you still have time before your home leagues start. So don't forget to check out revellabels.com. I just personally ordered my own draft kit from them yesterday. So there is st still definitely plenty of time. And you can also save 10% by uh, putting Nickel Press TV in a checkout. Uh, so there you go, another benefit to being a subscriber for Nickel Press TV. And uh, I guarantee this will enhance your draft. It will be the highlight of your draft if you get one of these custom made draft kits. They're very affordable, very glamorous, uh, beautiful things. They look like uh, my co host, Tahal Bedek. Uh, only if you were in a draft kit version. Um, so anyway, let's get to the show. We got a lot. We got a lot to get to today. Uh, we got our guests John Lobb and Richard Janvrin. We'll be getting to them in a minute. Uh, we're going to be asking, um, as we've been asking all our guests for their loves and their hates this season. But some of you uh, have commented that you want to get some sleepers and busts as well. So we've added that to uh, to the mix this week. We got the doctor here as, as always, and uh, he's going to discuss the Gronk scare as well as a, a couple big name rookies. But before we get to that, now that we've had some game action, let me ask my good friend, the Lord, what he thinks of what he sees so far in 2016. I'm watching the Denver Broncos quarterbacks, and I'm not feeling it at all. I'm not feeling Mark Sanchez. I'm not feeling the whole Simeon. Nobody even knows who this guy is. How did this happen? Why is this happening? How can you waste the whole season? You're a contending team, and you come into the season with this. There's so many people I'd rather have at quarterback than Mark Sanchez or Simeon. I would have traded for McCown. I would have traded for Glennon. I would have done all of these things that are possible. I'd rather have Nick Foles than either of these guys. I'd rather have almost anybody. These guys are terrible. That's what I'm feeling so far at the beginning of the season. There was a huge scare for fantasy owners in all of New England, which uh, we just so happen to have two guests from New England on the show tonight. But uh, I'm talking about Gronkowski, of course. And let's bring in the doctor, uh, Ceylon Parekh. Duke University orthopedic specialist. What can you tell us about Mr. Gronkowski? Yeah, well, Rich and, and John probably give us an idea of the scare that happened uh, and how Patriot Nation really reacted. But I mean, social media blew up yesterday when when Gronkowski pulled up and ended up in the locker room about 10 minutes after the seven on seven um, the drills are being done. Turns out that he actually has either a bruise of his hamstring or Think of it as just a strain of his hamstring. Sounds like a grade one. So the great news is Gronkowski's, you know, is a, a, a bull, man. This guy is strong. He's not going to let this hold him back. My guess is a week at max that he'll be out, maybe two. But we'll see him start of the season. I don't think he's going to miss a beat here. He didn't practice today, but that's normal after a strain of the hamstring. Um, you got to give him a few days to rest. But this guy is, I mean, this guy beat an infection multiple multiple uh, surgeries in his forearm this guy's gonna make it this is not an issue i know a lot of people are worried about him on the draft board but i don't i wouldn't think twice about this yeah i see a lot of people commenting that they think gronk is definitely going to be injured again at some point in his career and it's just kind of like built into what you get with gronk you take that risk uh so you're saying you don't see this being something that will derail him or sideline him for any uh any any time in the foreseeable future Absolutely not. I, I think this is this is a nothing for him. 
Um, and even, you know, people say, well, is he injury prone? Does he have problems? Is he getting older? Is he, is this going to bother him this season? I just don't think so. I mean, you look at his performance last year, he, this guy is an animal. And at least for now, in the next year or two, I just don't think these are things that are going to bother him. All right. So that sound you just heard was a collective sigh of relief from Patriot Nation, which is the bandwagon is huge at this point with all the Brady lovers, but whatever, let's move on. Uh, I wanted to ask you about Josh Doxson because this was a very polarizing uh, player throughout the whole NFL draft process. Mm -hmm. Landed in Washington. Some people say he's too old. Some people say he's just right. Some people say he's a bust. Some people say he's, he's going to be the greatest thing ever. Uh, he's right. dealing with an Achilles injury. So how, how will this set him back to start his uh, career? All right. So in a word, worry about it. Well, three words, right? Worry about it. But um, this is the problem with Achilles tendon tears or, or Achilles tendon issues they can nag and persist for a while. And if they persist and they start affecting your performance, now you really worry about uh, potential tears. So we, we looked at this uh, uh, NFL players who had Achilles tears about three, four years ago. And the interesting thing is the season before these guys tear their Achilles tendon, their performance drops. And we think that that has to do something with their Achilles. So a guy like him who in May injured his Achilles and now three, four months later is still unable to come out of his boot worry about it. I, I think that even if he plays season, it's going to be with significant limitations. Let me move on to one other rookie. Uh, he's not going to see a lot of time this year, but he did just get a new weapon in his receiving core with uh, Doriel Green Beckham going to the Eagles. I'm talking about Carson Wentz. Uh, yeah. Suffered a hairline broken rib. or What, mm -hmm. what exactly is that? Can you explain that to yeah. So myself? Thursday night, you know, Thursday night, he actually says that he didn't really even feel or know that he broke his rib. They don't even really know when it actually happened. So that's good news because he probably took a hit at some point and cracked a tiny little break in the bone. The x-rays didn't pick it up, which again means it's really tiny. A CT scan or a CAT scan is what picked it up. Um, a hairline fracture, you know, quarterbacks play in the NFL with true breaks, not just a hairline tr fracture, but a true break through the ribs with one or two ribs wearing increased to rib padding and things like that. So this is nothing. And, and obviously, you know, he's, he's going to be spending a lot of time on the bench unless, you know, uh, they have quarterback issues and he sees early time. But within four weeks, I don't think this is an issue for him. So, uh, you know, Eagle Nation was worried about it. I'm not worried about it. Doc, as always, we appreciate all the expert insight analysis. So let's move to the panel now. Uh, let me bring in our guests this week. We have Richard Janvrin of Bleacher Report, as well as John Laub of Football Diehards. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us this week. We are uh, going to give you a chance to identify yourselves and drop, you know, where you're working, how people can follow you throughout your answers to these questions. But really, the point is to put you in the hot seat. So let's get right into it. I'm going to start with you, Richard, because the guy on your favorite list is a guy that I haven't seen in many other places, and that is 49ers wide receiver Torrey Smith. You have him listed as one of your favorites entering this draft season. Please tell me why I should be listening to you on this one. <laughs> well, well, with Torrey Smith, I mean, it's, you know, obviously in week one of the preseason, we saw some uh, less than stellar quarterback play from uh, Gabbert and company. But look, there's there's nobody there's nobody else um, there's nobody else to throw to on the 49ers. I mean, yeah, you got Vance McDonald and you got Bruce Ellington and Sean Drone out of the backfield. But <clears throat> I mean, you look at it. Even if they throw say 500 times, how many of those targets are going to go to Torrey Smith? A lot. So I mean, I saw a nice piece by Matt Harmon of NFL.com where he said that wide wide receiver twos, so like the top 24 wide receivers to receive between 120 and 149 uh, targets, uh, 40, it was like 45 point something percent of the time finished within you know, the top 24 wide receiver range. And I see Torrey Smith getting there. Even if his catch rate isn't that great, I still think that he's a, he is a deep threat. Um, and I think that he's gonna tear it up. And I think people are sleeping on him because he's going way too late right now. All right, well, he moved to San Francisco last year, had his worst season by far as a pro only had 62 targets. So you're basically saying he triples his targets uh, now that Chip Kelly's in town with his his uh, up-tempo offense and Blaine Gabbert, who a lot of people are, you know, jumping uh, on the bandwagon thinking he can re resurrect his career uh, with Chip Kelly as well. I mean, 
this is assuming Gabbard even beats out Kaepernick. Uh, and I, I agree with what you're saying about not having a lot of targets in San Francisco to throw to, or, or a lot of weapons, I should say. Uh, but you're not scared at all about what Torrey Smith showed in his first year. Uh, you don't think this is a trend that's going to continue going on the decline? Yeah, I'm on board. I mean, because like I said, I mean, there, there's nobody really to throw to. I mean, and Torrey Smith's going to be the number one. There's no more Anquan Bolden. I mean, I don't care who the quarterback is. They're going to throw it to him, um, and they're, they're going to connect. I mean, even because Torrey Smith's not a guy who really has a high catch rate throughout his career, but he's always uh, he's always finished as a top. I think yeah, what top wide receiver like a, 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 a wide receiver too when he's had you know good target a good amount of targets. He's looking at him in Baltimore. Uh, he always finished right around there. I know last year in San Francisco stunk, but going to turn around this year. I'm telling you, he's going to be a wide receiver too, and you're all drafting him like right around the wide receiver 40 range, and it's going to be some good value. It was double in value. Yes, Mr. Love. I happen to agree with Richard. I think Torrey Smith's a wonderful value. I've been drafting him in about rounds 10 or 11. He easily doubles the targets. We know that it's a high-volume passing offense in San Francisco. He's definitely the best talent at the wide receiver position. Obviously, I'm not in love with playing Gabber or Colin Kaepernick. But you know what? The game flow dictates that San Francisco is going to be behind often. They're going to be underdogs. And in fantasy football, we love garbage time. And, you know, I could see Torrey Smith with two catches, 30 yards, at the end of the third quarter. And fantasy fans are freaking out, throwing something, yelling about Richard and me, telling him to start them. And then all of a sudden, you know, he goes off four catches, 80 yards, fourth quarter. Because San Fran's going to have to chuck the ball. I mean, they're just – they're not going to be a productive offense. They're going to be a bad football team. That means Torrey Smith gets targets. I'll take the shot. You look at their first few games, you got the Rams, you got, um, who else, the Seahawks. I mean, teams like that. I mean, it's not a, it's not going to be a, a good great game script for the run game. They're going to have to chuck the ball, and it's going to be to Torrey Smith. Okay, so sure, surely you hating the 49ers have to find something wrong with this selection of Torrey Smith as a guy to love this draft season? <clears throat> First of all, I'm the biggest Torrey Smith fan there is. <laughs> the He's a legend. He's underused. Legend. It's a bad, a bad place for him to sign. I, I really thought he would expand on his game. I thought he was better at over the middle. Route. I thought he'd be better at shorter stuff than he is. It seems like they've insisted upon making him a one-trick pony. That's all he's kind of done his whole career. There was one season I saw him get a little bit more involved in the intermediate passing game. Blaine Gabbert, I despise. I'm not a fan. He's terribly inaccurate. Are they going to be able to throw down the ball down the field? Were they able to do that last year? I mean, not really. It seems like he has a connection with, with uh, Vance McDonald. That would look nice at the end of last year, the preseason this year. And then uh, – Everybody's really hyping up Ellington, so we'll see what happens there. But it'll just come down to if Gabbert can throw the deep ball. Because, yeah, he, Torrey Smith realistically should be targeted a ton. So I'm hoping that happens. But it probably won't be good to go against the Seahawks in that game, no matter how far they are behind. Because we go for every single pick, and we go for every single sack, and we go for every single statistic humanly possible and they will destroy Blaine Gabbert and probably injure Torrey Smith for the season if they attempt to go deep when they're down by three or four touchdowns in the fourth quarter. If they try to go deep to him, he's going to get his head taken off back there. So I wouldn't do that. So I probably wouldn't start him against Seattle. But other than that, I feel what you guys are saying totally. As you guys mentioned, he's currently wide receiver 45, according to Fantasy Football Calculator. Uh, I'm talking in PPR leagues. He's the 110th player overall. Guys going after him, though, Travis Benjamin, Kamar Aiken, uh, Michael Thomas of the Saints. Uh, I personally would rather have any one of those three guys over Torrey Smith. But that's just my personal opinion. You guys did a wonderful job selling the argument. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Lobb here, the uh, gridiron scholar, and find out why you love actually probably my favorite wide receiver heading into the season. Third-year guy, Mike Evans. Uh, he's got Jameis Winston throwing on the ball now. Uh Probably my favorite receiver last year was DeAndre Hopkins. Uh, I feel like Evans is going to be on that level of explosion um, this year. 
Uh, it's kind of hard to explode from what he's done, but I think you put the, the touchdowns from his rookie season, the yardage and receptions from his sophomore season, you put that all together, add a little bit to it, and you have a top five wide receiver. But that's just me. I'm going to leave it up to my man, the scholar, to let me know why Evans is one of his loves. I've done eight drafts, and in the second round of every draft, I've taken Mike Evans so far this year. Absolutely love him. I absolutely love that Dirk Cotter offense. I love the simpatico that he has with Jameis Winston. I know that he had drops last year, but I'm a believer that drops are overrated. A lot of great receivers have had drops. What I like is Jameis Winston kept going back to him. Jameis Winston did not lose confidence in his stud, Mike Evans. All the reports from the offseason are tremendous. Mike Evans has worked on this. He wants to be a better player. He's not content with being a good player. He also has a great quarterback. I really like Jameis Winston. I have loved him at Florida State. I love him in the NFL. He exceeded my expectations as a freshman. He's leading this club as a second-year quarterback. I believe that Evans gets at least 150 targets this year, even if he has an uptick in the catch rate. If he just jumps up 5%, he still had 1,200 yards last year, and that was a bad season. We're basing that on three touchdowns. Now, I don't see any reason he doesn't get double-digit touchdowns this year. The targets are going to be there. Dirk Cotter is going to make sure he calls plays for the big man in the red zone. Winston has confidence in him, and he's going to let him fight for the football. I think that he easily gets 1,350 yards and 11 touchdowns. I'm all in on Evans. He's going to be a stud. You guys, no, no, we don't have to talk about it anymore. You know how I feel about Evans. You No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Go well, ahead. I was just going to add another little nugget there. Um, if you look over the last three games of last year, uh, the Buccaneers ranked fifth in pass attempts per game at 42. So if that carries over into next season, another year of Winston, they're going to keep throwing the ball. Yeah, they got Doug Martin, but yeah, I'm all in on Evans too. I agree. Am I a Mike Evans fan? Of course. <laughs> of course. Am I all in on Mike Evans? Of course not. Uh, I'm a big fan, but there's nobody I really have to have this year in the second round. But I do like that analysis. So maybe he just maybe talked me in. To taking him in the second round going forward here but yeah I mean I'm always been a big Mike Evans fan I'm a big fan of all those kind of larger receivers that I'm also not big on the drops thing being a huge thing I get in arguments with my friend all the time he's thinking he was talking about Jarvis Landry or something how he had such a high drop rate I'm like this dude is a baller I don't care about the drop rate these guys are let are these guys it doesn't matter for them really so I mean I don't care about the drop rate at all I'm not worried about it and uh, Mike Evans is the star. He's going to be fine. So I'm, I'm with it. I'm with it. Second round, I'm sold. I want to add, the way you have your hair done this week, it almost looks like it's a crown. And with the light behind you, it's shining. So let me keep it with John. Let me keep it with John. You have uh, on your hate list, Jamal Charles. Just came off the pup list. A lot of people are excited. I know one guy in particular, Ty Miller, Ty St. Louis, uh, couldn't control himself today uh, over the news of Jamal Charles coming back. Um, so he's been given a good bill of health. He's got people nipping at his heels in the Chiefs backfield. Why are you so down on Jamal Charles this year? Well, first, I understand everything about the rain, the Andy Reid offense, from Deuce Staley to Brian Westbrook to LaShawn McCoy and Jamal Charles. Andy Reid is a great coach. He gets production out of that offense. So I get that. However, two ACL injuries, not one, two, my friends. That very much bothers me. And I do believe by kickoff, Jamal Charles is on the wrong side of 30. So I don't like that in my running backs. Now, I think he might have a good opening month and he's going to be serviceable at times. What worries me is can he make it through a 14-game season or 16? Can he play 14 games and can he make it through the 16-game season? And I think you're forcing yourself to get 
Spencer Weir, and maybe even possibly Ch Charkandrick West. Unless I'm in an 18-team league with huge rosters, I particularly don't want to take three Kansas City running backs. I'm just a little bit wary of this situation. He is a second rounder. I understand why people like him. I'm not convinced that he makes it for a full 16-game season. I'm bypassing Jamal Charles everywhere. I understand what people like about him. I understand he's been a fantastic running back over the last three years. I'm just not interested in drafting him. I like the big receivers in the first two rounds. Let someone else take them. I'm on board with you. Do either of you uh, two gentlemen have anything to rebut to that? I mean, I don't, I don't hate Jamal Charles necessarily. I, I still think he has value. Um, but, yeah, the ACL injuries and, you know, being on the wrong, uh, wrong side of 30, um, definitely concerning elements when you uh, factor into uh, drafting Jamal Charles. I'm I'm probably avoiding him, although I'm a, I'm a huge fan. But yeah, I love their running back core as a whole. I just uh, yeah probably don't want anything to do with that. I would take it probably late mid late second. Still probably not have a problem there. The upside is still pretty high. Highest highest yards per carry of any running back in NFL history. He's a legend, bro. Get him. I mean, and realistically, he hasn't been as hurt quite as much as one would think. He missed mostly missed 14 games one season, I think, and then missed. He only played five games last season, I think. Other than that, he's played, I think, 14, 15 games every single season. So I have faith that he'll bounce back, but those other guys have looked so good that they got to get a little work, keep him fresh. He probably is not going to be a total workhorse, but I'm still kind of feeling him in the second round, but probably won't end up on very many of my teams. I hear you. Well, uh, I've come to uh, accept the fact that being a Jet fan makes you kind of like the laughing stock of the NFL. But we are still very passionate about our team. Uh, I say this and preface this because every week our guests love to take shots at Jet players. And that leads me into Richard's hate, which is Matt Forte. I do want to point out he's currently being drafted as the 16th running back off the board, 43 overall. I do also want to point out to you that he's only missed eight games out of a possible 128 in his career. He finished... 2015 as a top 10 running back, uh, despite missing three games. So I don't understand why so many people want to uh, just write this guy off already and say he's over the hill and it's a sharp decline. I'm not avoiding him. I just hate the val. I just hate where he's being drafted right now. He's being drafted too high for me, in my opinion. I mean, you look at you look at Matt Forte and you see a guy who's been one of the best PPR running backs in the history of fantasy football. But you're also looking at a guy who has over 2,000 lifetime carries. And so he's obviously on the wrong side of 30 as well, just like Jamal Charles. So I have questions for, you know, is he going to get a ton of work? You know, when you have Kyrie Robinson and Bilal Powell in the backfield, I think Bilal Powell steals some, uh, some touches away in terms of um, in the passing game. And then also this is an offense that totally relies around um, Brandon Marshall and Eric Decker. So, Right now, he's being drafted as a fringe RB1, and I just think that that's too high right now. I absolutely agree with Richard. I mean, I've enjoyed watching Matt Forte, one of the great backs of the last five years. I would rather invest in Belial Powell. The draft capital is so much less, and we saw Belial Powell down the stretch last year. He was very productive, especially in PPR leagues. So I'd rather dip into that high-scoring Jets offense I'll take Belial Powell after the 10th round, let someone else grab Matt Forte, and we'll see where the chips lie and who stays healthy all season long. Yeah, you see, everybody's making the Belial Powell argument just because the, the, the ceiling is higher for where you can draft them. And, uh, you know, it, it, it'd be easier to crash with Forte's value at this point. However, I want to just add that the reason Powell was able to thrive last year is because Chris Ivory's really – fundamentally a, a early down running back who is just carrying the ball and is not much of a receiving threat at all. He can catch the ball. They just have never used him in that regard. So Powell was able to come in in that capacity. Um, Forte kind of eliminates the need for that. He could and should be on the field for all three downs the majority of the time, which will limit Powell's touches. Uh, so barring any type of injury or uh, 
just complete fall off a cliff for uh, Forte's, you know, production. I just don't think Powell gets onto the field as much as he did last season. So that's my only knock on that. But Mr. Uh, Mr. Lord, Mr. Baddock, Mr. T. Hall. Well, that's an interesting point that you make, considering Forte is like 35 years old. You don't think he's going to need a little bit of rest here and there from Bilo Powell. It's confusing to me why everybody's talking about Powell this year like he's some new thing or something. This guy's been doing the same thing for like five years. He is what he is. I don't think he's really going to exactly. exceed that. Exactly. Powell's so, the 35-year-old. People acting like he's some new dude or something. Like this dude been doing the same thing for five years or however many years. So I'd be more... He kind of, again, like you said, he kind of replaces what Forte does. They can both do that, but who's the? They got to have another guy in the mix there, right? Is it Kyrie? It's Kyrie, right? I don't know. If you're getting him late like that, it's probably worth the risk. I'm just like I'm just confused as why Powell is like this new thing, kind of like Riddick in Detroit. People are like acting like he's a new dude. Like this guy's been there for. I remember when he was first there. They're saying he's not good or he's not doing whatever. He's exactly the same as he was two years ago, but now. It's whatever. It's whatever, man. I'm not. I don't care. Move on. <laughs> That's it. Wrap it up. Um, so Wrap. we have uh, four running backs remaining between the two uh, guests we have this week, uh, sleepers and busts. And we've talked about all four of these guys in the past two episodes at various points. Uh, we might expand on that a little this week. Uh, I'm gonna just rattle them off to you. Richard sleeper this year is Isaiah Crowell uh, or Crowell uh, and. Uh, John's is Duke Johnson, who we went over pretty extensively last week. Uh, John's bust is Arian Foster, and Richard's bust is Jeremy Langford. I want to hear Richard talk. Well, first of all, I'm interested in Richard saying Crowell is a sleeper because I've always been a big Crowell fan. So I'd like to hear him talk about that. And then I'd like to hear Vijay Ajahi, his infatuation, his obsession, his spank bank full of Jay Ajahi. 40 time video or something. I don't know. He watches Jay Jahi video three hours a day, it seems like. He has multiple <laughs> articles a week on Jay Jahi. So if this guy's not like break the rushing record this season, like it's going to be a disappointment. For Richard, I would like to see I, what he has to say about that. I heard Jay Jahi was the one who took the picture of Usain Bolt, and he was the only one fast enough to keep up with them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's any accuracy to that, but um, so why don't we start with Crowell? And okay. I, I will I will mention that he's going as the running back 40, uh, 44th running back right now. He's uh, 51st off the board overall. He was not scoring touchdowns, only had four in 2015, despite being fed. Well, I you know I, I subscribe a lot to the theory of, of the zero RB theory. I think that that's a, a great theory to go by. Um, if you want to, when you're, when you're drafting, but also I like value-based drafting. And I mean, you look at Isaiah Crowell and um, it's not too often that you can draft a running back, you know, in the forties, that's going to get roughly around 200 carries. Um, so I like his volume that he's going to be getting. Um, also, yeah, I know that his yards per carry wasn't all that great last year, but um, you know, according to football outsiders, the Cleveland Browns are the fourth worst um, offensive line last year. So that could have been part of it as well. You also look last year, there's really no weapons besides Gary Barnage. And now this year, you know, you're going to be able to extend the field a little bit more with Corey Coleman and Terrell Pryor and uh, Josh Gordon coming back. Also, um, I think their offensive line, I mean, it can't really get any worse at this point, uh, being, you know, the fourth worst last year. So, I mean, if he scores a little bit more, um, plus, you know, the additions of the, the weapons that the Cleveland has, I think Crowell makes for a pretty decent value pick later on in the uh, RB40 range. Well, his backfield mate is Duke Johnson, Johnson, who's John's sleeper. Is it possible that they can both be? Well, I think they're two different <laughs> league. I think they're two. I think they're fitted for two different types of league. I think Duke Johnson is definitely the guy you want PPR. But if, if you play in a standard league, because believe it or not, people actually do still play in those. Um, what? I th- yeah, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think Crowell uh, is a nice. Um, I think he could be a nice RB3 or maybe even a fringe RB2 in standard leagues. And right now he's going really, really late. So, um, again, it's all about the value. Uh, PPR, I, I, it'd be hard for me to make a case, but in standard, um, I like uh, I like where he's going. 
Okay. Richard, where did you get those hair plugs? That hairline is the greatest I have ever seen in my life. You like that? You like that? Incredible. Oh my god. <laughs> my barber real. messed up my hair though, man. He messed up my hair. He he faded the side too much, so I'm trying to hide it. And I probably just pointed it out. Nobody even noticed it. At my age, I'm just glad I got here. Half my friends are bald. So I'm looking good for an old man. I ain't gonna say nothing about no one's here. You guys look good. And I've been up for I don't know how many straight hours keeping up with the fantasy marathon. So I'm glad my hair I'm glad my hair is looking my hairline especially is looking as good as it is. And I, I thank you for pointing it out, former model Taylor. I, I had to do it. I had to do it. I had no choice. Thank you. Appreciate it. So John, let me go back to you with uh <laughs> with your sleeper being Duke Johnson. So first, I'm a big fan of Hugh Jackson. I think he's one of the underrated offensive coordinators in the NFL. Go back to his days when he was in Oakland. He really did not get a fair chance from the crazy old man, Al Davis. By that time, Al clearly had some Alzheimer's. He had serious problems in running that organization at that time, and they had fallen off the cliff. They only gave Hugh one season. Anyone who had actually seen that Raiders offense, they were actually productive. And before Darren McFadden got behind arguably the best offensive line of the last five years in the NFL, Darren McFadden had only been productive under Hugh Jackson. Then Hugh Jackson ends up with Marvin Lewis in Cincinnati. He ends up drafting Giovanni Bernard. I like Giovanni Bernard coming out of North Carolina. He was my second rated running back coming out of that draft. I really liked him as a playmaker, but Hugh Jackson made him a very good NFL player. Then he dipped into my other second favorite running back, who was Jeremy Hill. I had him ranked second out of that draft amongst the running backs. He had never gotten the shot at LSU that he had deserved. I love Jeremy Hill's power, strength, and I thought that was a great deal. And he had a thousand yard season coming right out of the gate for Hugh Jackson. The guy understands the running game. He understands how to use his backs. I do think Crowell's obviously in standard leagues. For all those, you know, Luddites who still play in standard leagues, obviously Crowell has more value. But Duke Johnson is one of the great runners in the Miami Hurricane history. The guy can run the football. I think at the end of the day, Duke Johnson is the better of the two backs. Now, obviously in PPR leagues, He's much more value. But what I like is Hugh's going to use him most effectively. He's going to get the Duke out into space. I think the game script dictates that Cleveland, once again, they're going to be behind. And we know just like Theo Riddick last year in Detroit, when a team gets behind by 10 to 17 points, they bring in those pass catchers onto the field and they get a lot of garbage time um, catches, just like Danny Woodhead did once Keenan Allen went down and that Chargers offense fell apart, he got a lot of garbage time catches. I'm all in on Duke. I think he's a very good talent, and Hugh Jackson will use him well. I've been drafting him in the fifth round all offseason. You guys are aware that hmm, T. Hall got the name of the Lord for being the Lord of Standard Leagues, right? <laughs> I did not. So, <laughs> you guys, I couldn't help. He's a standard league champion, but uh, there you go. But I actually got another little stat to try to help out with uh, John's Duke Johnson love. So I looked back at RG 3s 2012 season when he was, you know, great. Um, and I looked at his A dot, his average depth of target. He finished 23rd that year, which suggests that he can dump the ball off. And I think that that benefits Duke Johnson, a guy who had 70 targets last year, who finishes the RB 24 in PPR leagues. What is that called? A dot. A dot. Yeah. <laughs> Average depth of time. It's a it's a pro football focus term. Yes. So. It's fantastic. Uh, so, <laughs> Mr. Betting. I kind of like both of those guys. I, I I don't know why everybody's so down on Lakeford. I mean, I know they're dogging him for the uh, the drop rate or whatever. Again, I don't really care so much about what the stats say. A guy. How many passes he dropped his rookie year? First of all, he's a rookie. Second of all, who cares? It's a running back. He's the main dude. He's going to get the most 
uh, opportunity there. I think I liked what I saw to him in the past. The eye test for sure. I think he's going to be better than people are giving him credit for. A lot of people wagon. And then Jay Jahi and uh, I mean Arian Foster is just a superior player. I mean he's just coming off of multiple injuries. Of course, Jahi bounced to what the fifth round last year showed nothing. Obviously came off an injury. Obviously bounced there for reasons not aware of. Not sure why Dallas didn't take a flyer on him in the fourth or fifth round considering they had nothing at running back. So something's going on there. I've just not really seen anything out of Jahi yet. So maybe I'm wrong there, but it seems like the coaches are already hyping up Foster like they're hoping he takes the job and runs with it so they only have to give a Jahi maybe some garbage time and then the, the game or two where Foster has to sit because he tweaked his back banging out someone's chick or something. You know how he does it. All right. All right. <laughs> Take it away, Richard. I forgot which running back we're talking about. <laughs> you were gonna, you were gonna rip into him about Langford. I'm all about Langford. Okay, look. Okay, I know how he did last year, but there's some stats. I'm not really a huge stats guy, but all these really? stats I agree with. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a stats guy. Okay, I'm really not. But okay, so first of all, inefficient runner. He had how many carries? A, near 150, finished with, I think, a yards per carry average of 3.6. And then Pro Football Focus, my favorite website on the history of the internet, besides mm-hmm. Twitter.com, of course. Um, he finished with the worst I don't elusive. Think being honest. <laughs> <laughs> he finished with the worst elusive rating, according to Pro Football, Pro Football Focus, which measures basically a running back and how hard they are to be taken down. Finished with the second worst breakaway percentage, which are basically the percentage of yards, the percentage of his yards that come on 15 yard runs or longer. Um, he had eight drops. I know you mentioned the drops. And he finished with the third worst pass blocking efficiency. And we know that pass blocking equals snaps in the NFL. And, per, and perhaps the most damning evidence against Langford is this. Are you ready, Tail? You ready for this? I'm about to blow your mind. Okay. So in John Fox's entire head coaching career, there has been just one running back to see more than 60% of the total team carries. That was D'Angelo Williams. And I think that was the year that he scored all those touchdowns. And it was 61%. It's going to be a committee. I like Jordan Howard a lot as another value pick. And Langford's going, again, I don't, I just, I, with everything, I just don't, I just don't want him. Don't want what him. What were D'Angelo's numbers that year? Off the top of my head, I don't know. Ask John Lobb. He, he knows. Look at him. He's getting ready. No, uh, you know, I, I remember because my brother beat me in a championship game with that bastard from Carolina that year. <laughs> and I think he had like 14 touchdowns because I think those last eight games, D'Angelo <laughs> Williams went off and I yep. didn't have him. So I was pissed. But it was ridiculous how good D'Angelo Williams, you know, it was like my brother brought the British Man of War with all 20 guns out. And he just shot me down in the open sea. I was so pissed. Because, <laughs> I mean, based on where Langford, based on where Langford's going, and you know, compare that to where Jordan Howard's going. I mean, it's just so wide. And John Fox has gone on record. This is going to be a committee. You know, they want two guys. I think Jordan Howard is a more prototypical goal line back. And mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know what? I'm gonna bold prediction on the air. Jordan Howe is going to finish with more fantasy points than Jeremy Langford in 2016. Book it. Okay? I like that. I like that. I just drafted uh, Jordan Howard in uh, the draft for Giants MFL 10 that uh, we had going on through Nickel Press. Uh, Side note, I shared a flight with John Fox going back from the Senior Bowl. and uh, have asked him about the running backs. Yeah. Well, (laughs) we didn't get around to the running backs. But, uh, all right, let's go into uh, let's go into John and your reasoning for Arian Foster being a bust. I you praise know, you, John. Uh, I think you know I've gone through this veteran All Pro switches teams. I've seen a Tony Dorsett going to Denver. I've seen it with Eric Dickerson going to the um, Los Angeles Raiders. I've seen it with O.J. Simpson going to the San Francisco 49. Oh, I got Richard now. I shouldn't have said O.J., I know. (laughs) But I have seen this time and time again, the 30-year-old running back, and I do believe by kickoff, Arian Foster is going to be 30 years old. August 24th. August 24th. 24th. Oh, I know. know. 
I know. <laughs> I just have no confidence that he's going to be able to be that great running back we saw in those years in Houston. Gase runs a different scheme, a different line blocking scheme. He was terrible on a per carry basis last year. I think he averaged 2.6. He was just awful. His production came as a pass catcher. If you look at the box scores, Foster still could do something in space when the safeties and the linebackers were trying to cover DeAndre Hopkins deep and they just dumped the ball off to Foster. So there is some value as a pass catcher. I just do not have any confidence in these 30-year-old backs who are on the downside of their careers. He just got to Miami, I believe it was three weeks ago, so he is going to learn a new playbook. Now, obviously, as a running back, we're not talking, you know, Galileo's theory of gravity here during the Renaissance where you have to explain it to some priests who barely read. So <laughs> he should be able to get That's this the greatest running thing I've ever heard. going. But I just don't believe in Arian Foster. <laughs> uh, anything I say for the rest of the show could not top <laughs> what John just said. Um, if you don't mind, if you don't mind, Andy, I'm going to jump on and uh, just yeah. keep this Aaron yeah, right. Foster hate it's rolling. All right. So as John mentioned last year, before, while he played in the four games that he played in, very inefficient runner, under three yards per carry. He was only so good because of what he did in the passing game. And then over his last 48 games, he's played in just 52% of those, which equates to 25 games. So 25 out of the last 48 games, not very good. Now, I have here, I have one whole sheet right here of all of his injuries, okay? 2010, off-season meniscus surgery. 2011, torn hamstring, missed the first three games. So 2013, you know, he missed, uh, he missed um, some tra uh, training camp time. Then he had back surgery, which uh, that was um, – Later in the year, he went on IR. 2014, hamstring, misses the preseason. You get the point. I mean, the guy has had more injuries than all four of us put together times 10, okay? And uh, I just I just can't imagine. I, I keep coming back to this. Whenever I write an article about Jay Ajayi, which I only write one, but tail teams, I think I write 57 of them. But I just cannot imagine a world where Arian Foster has more than – 130 carries this year. I just cannot imagine a world like that. I just, I just can't. My main reason I'm wondering is do you like Jay Ajahi so much because he's the only option there or because he's a star waiting to explode? I'm just confused. Well, I like Ajahi. I liked him coming out of Boise State. I think he was the full package. You know, the knee, the knee thing is so bizarre to me. And I, I've, believe me, I, I've probably looked into this more than Jay Ajayi's mom, you know, his knee problems, because I just care so much about the guy. I've but noticed. Yeah. Tahal to might have looked into his mom as well. Okay. okay. <laughs> but I just the, – the, so, of course, leading up to the draft, you know, you have this report of him being bone on bone, which that has never been anything ever. I mean, he passed <laughs> – it's just never been a thing before that report. Anybody, you know, you never heard about it with Boise State. Yeah, he tore his ACL. And, you know, as a guy, personally, I, I'm bone on bone. And, I mean, if he is bone on bone, he is toast. I'll say that. He's toast. But um, I think I think small sample size last year, I think he's built to be – I think he's more built to be a three-down back if he can figure out the receiving game. I mean, you look at the ADPs of both of these running backs. Jay Ajayi, I'm going to try to do this with the mirror image, but Jay Ajayi starts up here, Foster's down here, and then they go like this over time. It's just amazing to me. Went, you almost went bone on bone. <laughs> I did. I, they do go bone on bone. If you look at their ADPs, they do go bone on bone. But it's just uh, Ajayi is going like almost near RB40 in both formats, and that is insane to me. I don't get it. I don't, I'm not saying he's the second coming of Christ. You know, don't get me wrong. But, I mean, to go as late as he's going, man. And then Foster's going as an R RB2. Yeah. So I, I, I thought you were going off Rudy Giuliani from the middle to the side, to the top, to the bottom. But, to the window, uh, to the wall, you know. But, yeah. You know. <laughs> so, Mr. Mr. Baddock, are, are you uh, convinced of any of these uh, bus theories from 
Mr. Jay Brand. I'm totally buying the Arian Foster's a bust there. Am I, am I buying in Jay Jahi? I, I would gladly take him as late as he's going in these drafts. I'd gladly eat at people like that late and see if they just get, it's worth it if they're even close to being starting running back. But uh, am I like hyping him up? No, not really, but we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to see if Foster still got something left. He is kind of a unique dude. He has been crazy injury prone, but he always seems to bounce back. Last year was fairly limited uh, and was coming off the injury. Again, I know it's another injury, but he was coming off of that, so maybe he wasn't fully in the zone yet. But uh, their running situation was a joke in total last year, so maybe it wasn't totally his fault. I'm not sure. I'm not really high on either. would have to be kind of a gift fall in my lap type of thing for me to take either one of them type of deal. Let me just remind all you guys to check out the dope charts from friend and writer uh, Ryan, the FF Ghost. Uh, you can find out the links to the dope charts through his Twitter account at FF at the FF Ghost, uh, or just by following some of the links on uh, Nickel Press TV. We're going to be giving away five free copies of those, uh, so stay tuned. Phenomenal work. Uh, let's wrap things up now with our guests. Uh, I'm going to start with. Uh, Dr. Lobb, I'm making you a doctor after all the uh, well-reasoned uh, thoughts and theories you've given us tonight. So you have 90 seconds to uh, plug yourself, let people know where they can find you, and tell us why you are so enamored with Jameis Winston's growth this this uh, offseason. First, I just – everything I've read about Jameis Winston, I've been impressed with him as a leader. I believe that there is an ineffable quality to leading men on the football field. You can't necessarily quantify it by data, but anyone who's been a leader, a teacher, anyone who's been a police officer, when you are around men, Winston has that quality. So I love Winston. I've been drafting him all over the place. I'm no problem in late quarter, late round quarterbacks. And I think Winston and Kirk Cousins are my two guys that I've been targeting. Please go to footballdiehards.com. I do NFL and I love fantasy college football. I have all types of college football stuff up there. If you want to get a head start on your competitors, play college fantasy football. I can't recommend it enough. 28 years of NFL fantasy football, eight years of college fantasy football. I love it. Do it. You'll enjoy it. And I'm at GridironSkull91 on Twitter. Feel free to ask me a question anytime. I'll be glad to respond. Now that's how you do an outro. That was well yeah. done. All right, Richard, you got your work cut out for you. All right, you got 90 seconds. Drop a line where they can find you, what you're promoting, and why. Well, you did the Miami running back, so I'm going to leave you with your other intriguing headline. My hometown team, my favorite team. Tell me what intrigues you about the Jets quarterbacks this season. Yes, you can find me on Twitter at Richard Jamrin. You can find all my work over at BleacherReport.com and make sure to download our app, uh, the Team Stream app. I'm sure all of you have it, but just in case you don't. Um, the Jets the Jets quarterbacks, I mean, this, is, this isn't necessarily a fantasy thing, but from a real football standpoint, it's very weird of the situation they put themselves in. They re-signed Fitzpatrick. They have Geno Smith. Uh, they have Bryce Petty, who is obviously not ready yet. And then they have Christian Hackenberg, who they've said that they don't want to play at all this year. So they're going to really carry four quarterbacks into the season and kind of compromise their roster a little bit. It's interesting to see, and I'm going to be interested to see how, how they, they do it. I don't know if they're going to, you know, not show showcase Christian Hackenberg and try to squeak him on the practice squad or what. But I find it inter interesting. I don't know the last time a, a team has gone into the season with four quarterbacks, but it could be done for the first time this year. Or not the first time, but the first time since whatever was done last. And that would be yeah. a Jets move. Right. Three below average quarterbacks and one who just had a career year. That's exactly. So it's so exactly. bizarre to me, man. It's so bizarre. I don't have a lot to say. I'm excited for week two. I had a long day today. I'm glad the guys figured out how to flip my face on here. <laughs> Great time. As I always do, I hope we can do this again soon. Thanks for tuning in again. Hope you enjoyed episode three. Next week, our guest will be TJ Hernandez of 44.com and Graham Barfield, who's now writing for Roto World. Uh, we'll see you then. Hope hopefully, you'll be back. <laughs>